What is a healthy human temperature? How many of you think that a healthy human temperature is 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit? OK, yeah. For those of you who didn't vote, this is a trick question because it turns out that although this is a simple insight that we learned in school, growing up, at the doctor, this is something many of us have never questioned, and yet it's not true. In fact, each person has their own healthy baseline, and there is a dynamic range of temperatures that are healthy. For example, you might have a healthy baseline of 98.6. My healthy baseline is 97.3. So by the time I go to the doctor with a temperature of 98.6, that could be a fever for me. And you can see how this averaging and generalizing of our health that we've done for many years in medicine can lead to misdiagnosis or underdiagnosis. Traditionally, medicine has measured dozens of things, primarily in people when they are sick at the doctor. Our lab at Stanford, the Snyder Lab, takes a very different approach. We measure millions of things, primarily while people are healthy and even at home. And we do this frequently and in some cases continuously. We measure social connections, genomes, and also functional indicators of health, like how you're using your DNA and transcribing it into RNA, which is called transcriptomics proteins, metabolites, microbiome, epigenetics, and also the exposome, which is the collective exposures of diet, lifestyle, stress, toxins, and other, uh, for example, biological pathogens you're exposed to in your day-to-day -day life. This deep profiling continuously allows us to establish a healthy baseline for each person. And by establishing your own personal health baseline, we can identify the right treatments for the right people at the right time. And the reason I said the right treatments instead of the right medicine is because precision health and healthy baseline profiling actually allow us to go beyond reactively treating disease to proactively preventing disease and proactively improving health and potentially even improving aging. So we did this strategy in 109 people over eight and a half years in the Snyder Lab. We identified 49 major actionable health discoveries. And these were across a range of different conditions, including prediabetes, diabetes, cardiovascular events, stroke, and even cancer. And many of these were years ahead of clinical detection. Early detection can save lives. Many people are needlessly dying, for example, from heart attacks, say, walking down the street. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer on our planet. And yet, in many cases, it's preventable. For example, something as simple as taking an aspirin, if there's enough notice that it's happening. In addition to multiomic profiling, we're also using wearable devices that continuously monitor people over time to predict and prevent disease, including infection. Early detection, especially in a pandemic, can save not only individual lives, but also community lives. We were able with 80% accuracy to detect COVID-19 on average three days ahead of when people felt sick or had symptoms, using Fitbits, Apple Watches, Aura Rings, and other wearables. And we did this in 5,000 patients. A major discovery in our lab using multiomic profiling has been that different people age differently. We know that there are certain clinical markers that tend to be higher in older populations, for example, cholesterol. But again, we wanted to understand beyond the population level, on an individual level, how people are aging. 
Researchers in our lab tracked 43 healthy humans of varying ages for five years using deep multiomic profiling. What we found was that there are four major categories of agers within our cohort. So if I have 100 cars, each one of you in this room has a car, <laughs> I can imagine that one car might have the engine go out first, one car might have the transmission go out first, one car might have the battery go out first. Just like cars, humans also have different organs and different systems that are aging at different rates. And this is also in part because we're using them differently. By understanding our own personalized aging profiles, we can again develop the right treatments for the right person at the right time to not only prevent aging, but potentially to even reverse it. This particular study was done over a two-year period, which is important because that's an actionable period of time. And we actually saw that there were several people in our cohort who utilized lifestyle strategies like diet, weight loss, and exercise that had a slowed aging profile. As you can see, different people have different aging profiles, and that continues in terms of which specific molecules are most correlated with each person's aging. So on the left, person one has two different molecules here that are correlated with aging. This person's a metabolic kidney and liver ager. And on the right, person two was categorized as a cardiovascular ager. When we think about aging and longevity and health, we can measure the body all day but the mind is also as important as the body. In fact, observational research shows us that social relationships are the number one predictor of longevity after midlife. In fact, depression and stress are known to accelerate epigenetic aging, and serious childhood adversity and trauma reduce life expectancy by 20 years. How does this happen? Well, one way that it happens is that our thoughts actually change the way that we use our DNA. Our thoughts and our beliefs actually drive physiological changes. So for example, if I have an environment, like I'm standing with my boss in his office, and I believe, you know, he asks me, how are you doing? I can think, my boss wants to help. So that's in the green here. So that would be a non-threat belief. Or I could think, he doesn't like me, my work isn't good enough. That's a threat belief. And this activates a whole downstream fight or flight pathway that can be activated by social threat and our repeated belief about the situation. So again, it's just by what I'm thinking that can actually change gene expression in, for example, immune cells and drive inflammatory processes. Given the importance of mental health and psychosocial factors in aging, our lab wanted to understand how we can improve mental fitness and how this relates to aging and metabolism. Currently, we're in a mental health crisis. One in five Americans are suffering with mental health. The treatments are not working well. If you read the news, <laughs> you can see that every headline is talking about how, you know, for example, the serotonin hypothesis is not what we thought, and only 30% of people are getting better from antidepressant drugs. In addition, many people are unable to access therapy. Even 96% of Wyoming is said to live in a healthcare shortage area. For this reason, our lab wanted to understand what are highly scalable mental fitness practices that can improve psychosocial outcomes and potentially even aging. We evaluated two immersive programs. Our results were astounding. We saw, so here in the gray, uh, our traditional therapies, and you can see that they are associated with a 65% or less reduction in depression score across the literature. Our results in the red showed an 82 to 86% reduction in depression scores. And more importantly, when we looked at what percentage of people actually convert from being known as clinically depressed to no longer depressed, 
actually 90 to 100 percent of our participants recovered from depression and also maintained that recovery for 14 plus months. And this is two to three times better than the standard of care. It's also twice as powerful as psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which currently has uh, FDA uh, breakthrough classification for major depressive disorder. More importantly, we also saw that positive psychosocial outcomes improved, including relationships, meaning, hope, life satisfaction, and well being. And the next step on this is asking, do these programs that improve psychosocial well-being and improve mental health, do they also improve aging as well as personalized aging profiles? And even can they reverse biological aging? Medicine of the past has been focused on illness, it's been reactive, measuring few things, infrequent, and it characterizes us on a population basis. Medicine of the future, precision health, is proactive, focused on well-being, measures many things, and is individual-based. We all want to live happy, healthy, and connected lives. Every single human being on the planet wants to experience good health care. By combining multiomic longitudinal profiling, mental fitness, and personalized aging patterns, we can understand individuals' aging and their individual's health, and we can identify the right treatments for the right people at the right time to improve well-being. Thank you.